In this lecture, we're going to consider optical isomers. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain what is meant by optical isomerism. You should be able to identify the chiral carbon in an optical isomer, know the meaning of the terms racemic mixture and enantiomers, and recall how geometrical and optical isomers differ in terms of physical and chemical properties. Right, let's consider optical isomers. So, optical isomers will arise when somewhere in the molecule you've got a carbon atom which is attached to four different groups. Okay? A different group could be a CH3, a C double bond O, a Cl, an H. So, so you've got one carbon atom in your molecule which is attached to four different groups, your molecule will be chiral. So let's take this very simple example where there's only one carbon atom in the molecule. It's attached to four different groups. Okay. CL, H, OH and BR. Okay. It will have a mirror image molecule. Okay. So sometimes you'll be asked to draw the mirror image of a molecule. The simplest way I find to do it is just, so imagine you've got a mirror there and do the exact opposite. opposite. So you've got CCL in the plane, the CBR in the plane, then the OH sticking out and the H sticking behind. Right. Those molecules look very similar. They are very similar, but they are different. You could not take that molecule and superimpose it on that molecule. They're mirror images of each other. They're like hands. That's the right hand, that's the left hand. They look very similar, but you can't superimpose them on top of each other. They are different. Just these molecules are different. You cannot pick that up and superimpose it on that molecule, just like a right hand and the left hand can't be superimposed on top of each other. So, these are called, another name for optical isomers are enantiomers. So enantiomers is a pair of optical isomers. And this carbon atom is referred to as the chiral centre. This is the carbon atom which makes this uh, molecule chiral, which makes this mo these molecules optical isomers. So, here's a quick question for you then. I've got three carbon atoms in this molecule. Which one is a chiral carbon? Okay, well, the answer is two. It's not one, because carbon, this carbon's got three H's attached to it, so that's not four different groups. This carbon has only got three groups attached to it, an OH, a double bond O, and then all this. But this carbon has got four different groups. It's attached to an H, it's attached to an OH, it's attached to a CH3, which is a different group from the COOH it's attached to. Although it's attached to both carbons, the actual groups are different. It's a methyl group and a carboxyl group. So that carbon there is a chiral carbon and it means that there's an optical isomer of this. So, what's the difference in the physical and uh, chemical properties of optical isomers? Right, when it comes to physical properties, unlike geometric isomers, which had slight differences in melting points and boiling points, enantiomers have identical physical properties in all things except this rather weird thing. They have an opposite effect on plain polarised light. Okay, so what does that mean? You don't need to have a great understanding of it, but I want to talk about it briefly because it's one of the ways we can identify and differentiate between the enantiomers. It's a bit too physics for my liking. 
Right, this is a beam of light, okay, travelling through two polarizers. You can think of light as being waves, and it's made up of two waves, a wave that's travelling, oscillating vertical to this, or vertical to this plane, and one that's oscillating horizontally to the plane. And what this polarizer can do is it can remove either all the vertical light or all the horizontal light. So this polarizer here is removing all the horizontal light. So as the light passes through the polarizer, it will drop in intensity by a half. So you only get the light which is oscillating vertical to the axis. Then this second polarizer will only let through the horizontal. The, all the horizontal has already been removed by this polarizer, so no light will come through. I'm going to try and demonstrate that. I've got here two polarizers, pieces of Polaroid film. Okay, that's what these things represent. Okay, so if I hold this one up, you'll see that it decreases the intensity of the light. If I hold the other one up and have it in the same orientation as the first one, it has no effect. But as I rotate it around, see, it gradually blocks out all the light because I'm cutting out both the vertical of the first one and then all the horizontal with the second polarizer, and all the light is cut out. Okay, that's quite nice, but so what? So, what we find is if in between these two polarizers we put uh, our chiral substance, just one of the enantiomers, say we put one of the enantiomers in here, it bends, it rotates the plane polarized light. So, the vertical light that's come through this first polarizer gets bent a wee bit so that some light will now come through here. But what we find then, if we rotate the second lens a wee bit, it will cut out all the light. So we can measure the rotation we need to do to the second lens to cut out all the light. Okay. And what we find is that one enantiomer will rotate the light clockwise and the other enantiomer will rotate the light the exact same amount but anti-clockwise. So for example, if one enantiomer might rotate the light 10 degrees clockwise, the other enantiomer will rotate it 10 degrees anti-clockwise. And we actually call them sometimes right and left-handed uh, enantiomers, depending on whether or not they rotate the uh, light clockwise or anti-clockwise. So this is the only difference in the physical properties of the right and left-handed enantiomers. One will rotate plane polarized light in one direction, the other will rotate it by the exact same amount in the other direction. And its importance is just right on the fact that we use that to maybe analyse if we've got a pure sample or not. The importance of which I'll discuss in a minute. If you had an equal amount of both enantiomers in your sample, then you would cancel each other out. You know, you had some of the molecules rotating it to the clockwise and an equal number of molecules rotating it anti-clockwise. So the net effect to be no effect on the light. And that is known as a racemic mixture. When you have equal amounts of both enantiomers, the net effect is it has no effect on the light at all. Okay, oops, sorry, I didn't need that. So, let's look at the chemical properties of optical isomers. And these really are quite interesting. So the optical isomers have identical chemical properties except 
when they are in a Cairo environment. Now, very many biological reactions are in the Cairo environment. So optical activity is very important when it comes to biochemical reactions. As a lot of biochemical reactions will involve chiral molecules. Right, this is an infamous molecule, uh, it's called thalidomide and it was introduced in the 1960s. Uh, it was given to pregnant women who were suffering from very bad morning sickness and it had been shown to be very effective for relieving the symptoms of extreme morning sickness. Now this is a chiral carbon or a chiral molecule. Uh, the chiral molecule I think is this, is this carbon here. It's attached to four different groups. Uh, there's an H there which is not shown. It's attached to this nitrogen here and because this way around the ring is not the same as that way around the ring, that counts as two different environments. So that carbon there is a chiral carbon. So you get enantiomers of this molecule. You get right-handed and left-handed. Now somewhere in all the evidence and testing what was lost was that it was only one of the enantiomers that was very effective in uh, relieving morning sickness. I can't remember which way it was, right or left-handed one. But when it was mass produced, it was mass produced as a racemic mixture with equal amounts of the right and left-handed uh, molecule. And unfortunately the other molecule, let's say it was the left-handed molecule, had no effect on morning sickness but it did cause quite extreme birth defects. So in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there was an awful lot of uh, babies born with quite badly deformed uh, limbs that interfered with development of the arms and legs. And eventually it was tracked down to the fact of it was the other enantoma of the thalidomide drug that was being used for the morning sickness that was the cause of it. So, uh, it's a rather tragic example, but it does demonstrate the importance of uh, optical activity in biochemical reactions. Another less extreme example uh, are these two molecules. Uh, Carvone, the S stands for sinister, meaning the left-handed uh, carvone. And this is the right-handed carvone. This is the chiral carbon in both cases. And uh, both these have very different uh, smells to us. The left-handed one that smells like caraway, whereas the right-hand one smells strongly of spearmint. So this is a, another nice example of how the different chirality, well the different uh, enantiomers can have very different uh, biochemical reactions. So you should be able to explain what is meant by optical isomerism. You should be able to identify the chiral carbon in an optical isomer. You should know the meaning of the terms racemic mixture and enantiomers. And you should recall how geometrical and optical isomers differ in terms of physical and chemical properties.